um, you know, those pests which uh, really need act, um, in order to control them within schools, they often are problematic within schools because of the community connections. And we'll be, we'll be looking at particularly uh, cockroaches and bed bugs where uh, there are ongoing problems in schools because they're brought in from the community. Uh, so we've asked uh, three speakers, three experts in the areas of pests that have in, uh, for control um, have strong community connections, community collaboration uh, is needed. And, um, uh, uh, and our first presenter in that regard is uh, Dina Fonseca. Uh, she is the uh, professor in entomology at Rutgers University and also a director for the Center for Vector Biology. And she is a research associate in addition with the um, Sismo Sismodians, Sism Smithsonian's National Zoological Park. Her research involves the population genetics of invasive species, and in the case of disease vectors, how they affect epidemiological landscapes and risk estimates. Uh, she was a lead PI and a cooperative agreement to develop an area-wide management strategies for the invasive Asian tiger mosquito. And associated with that, I'm sure she developed a strong extension program working with professional mosquito control programs, and also a citizen science program with urban uh, mosquito control. Um, and additionally, she has been examining the effects of sea level rise on salt marsh mosquito populations. Adina's degrees are from the University of Columbia in Portugal, Central Michigan University, and the University of Pennsylvania. And uh, Adina, if you um, want to share your presentation, share your screen and turn on, turn on your mic. Well, I'm glad we had a few more minutes since I have to figure this out. Okay, um, can you see my screen? Just shake your head. Yes. Thank you, <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so thank you. So um, as I said, I am, well, I didn't say it, but the fact is I am not very familiar with school IPM. Um, however, because of uh, what Lynn just said, I've been working with communities um, to develop uh, mosquito control and um, schools are often right at the center of, of these of communities. And, and my understanding, and this is where I need your feedback, and I'll try to keep my talk shorter so we can, I can receive feedback from you. Um, I'd like to understand how schools may become maybe a, an important uh, partner in, in the kind of programs then that I, I've been developed. I, I, I am a population geneticist. I, I, I'm a DNA jockey, but actually started really working more and more with um, integrated pest management and directly with mosquito control programs, which uh, in New Jersey, I'm at Rutgers University, there is one for each county. Um, but I also work in Maryland, um, and now I'm talking, I know, with many people from other parts of the Northeast that don't have uh, such a, a dense um, source of mosquito control. And, and in, especially in, in Maryland, I, I felt that the communities, the residents were, were feeling a little, um, they had no real uh, way of controlling the mosquitoes that were biting them every time they're going into their backyard. So let, let me start with a little introduction. By the way, this, the work I'm gonna be um, describing has been published, uh, it's called Neighbors Help Neighbors Control Urban Mosquitoes. Um, and, and of note, um, about two thirds of the, of the authors on this paper are actually residents of this community that, um, into, that uh, actually made this all happen. All right, so as I mentioned, I wanna start from the beginning because uh, again, because I'm talking to a group of people that may not be normally doing mosquito control, um, I wanna start by sort of mentioning that our 3,500 species of mosquitoes, of, you know, take, take it or leave it, um, about 240, 240 species in the US and across the Northeast, any one state will have anything between 55 and 60 species. Uh, we are finding an increase in the number of species because we're, we're seeing more and more Southern species reaching us here in the, in the Northeast. So um, and there's sort of a, 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 a slow, uh, but, but steady increase in the, in the number of species and, and even 
states like Connecticut and New York are, are starting to see species that we normally would only see associated with more southern states. Um, however, out of these 50 to 60 species, there's only really a one handful, in many cases, one or two species that people um, interact with that are willing to bite people and, and become both uh, an important source of nuisance or in some cases a, a problem in terms of disease transmission. Now, mosquitoes that we tend to sort of we recognize mostly the adults, those that the females that bite, but mosquitoes have a complex life cycle where they lay eggs on water surfaces. They always have to be associated with some sort of water, standing water. Uh, they lay eggs that can sort of look like egg rafts, sort of your traditional view, the more common um, house mosquito. Um, and, and then the, the, the eggs develop into larvae. You have four larval stages. They're all aquatic, but although they are in the water, mosquitoes cannot breed underwater. So they have this little siphon. They have to come to the surface to get oxygen, like, like a snorkel. Um, and the larvae have the snorkel. And then the next stage, which is the pupa, the equivalent to a, you know, a butterfly cocoon, where they have the complete metamorphosis from the larval stage to the adult stage, also has this little Shrek-like little um, trumpets that they use for, for breeding air. So although you need water, these are terrestrial organisms. The pupa then, uh, as I mentioned, you have complete metamorphosis and becomes an adult. Um, the adult um, females are the ones that need a blood meal because they need the lipids and the protein to be able to make the eggs. The males don't bite um, and so um, it's really just half of the population that becomes a problem. But they can become a big problem. So the house mosquito is a mosquito that is willing and to go indoors and bite you in, in, in your house. Um, this is not something that is often the case for, for many mosquitoes. Even, even very big pest mosquitoes like the salt marsh mosquitoes, Edis solicitans, will not get indoors. Um, it's just not their thing. So you have these domestic species, this Culex pipiens is an invasive species from Europe, but more recently, we've had an additional uh, problem. So by the way, this is Culex pipiens, uh, sort of your nondescript brown mosquito. It's a, a dusk biter, um, tends to be the one that sort of ruins your barbecue in the evening. But more recently, we had um, an addition, and I know some of the Northeast states, thankfully, but maybe not for very long, still don't have uh, this other uh, mosquitoes, the invasive Aedes. Um, these mosquitoes will lay eggs individually, um, as you can sort of see, and they'll lay the eggs on the sides of containers. So instead of uh, the, the egg raft that is laid on the surface of water, these mosquitoes will lay eggs actually on the surface of whatever container they, they, that has water in them. And they'll do it actually above the water line so that when it rains, um, the, the, the eggs become submerged and the low oxygen level of the, when they become submerged is actually the stimulus for hatching. So they usually hatch after a rain event that increases the water in any, any kind of little container. Um, again, same thing, they have uh, the larval, four larval instars, pupae, and then you have an adult. And uh, these invasive aides, in particular, oh, they, just a picture here of the, the, the eggs. So the eggs are laid individually um, on the surface of, uh, of a container. This is actually a little bit of germination paper that we use as a way to detect the eggs in OV cups. So um, your classical um, picture of an uh, Asian tiger mosquito, Edis albopictus, is this black and white striped uh, organism with a very clear uh, white stripe on the, in the thorax. They're very easy to recognize. Um, and this is one of my classical, and we you think you're too small to be affected, remember your last encounter with a mosquito. So, you know, you can have, uh, you know, strong messages associated with mosquitoes. Um, you can use this in, a, in sort of a, a teaching mode. Um, the Asian tiger mosquito is really the, the, the only day biting mosquito we have in urban and suburban and pretty much anywhere where there are people and there are containers, you're going to have uh, the species as long as it's warm enough. So they've been spreading north um, and I know that they are now found in significant parts of New York State and Connecticut. So they're, they're, they're spreading. In New Jersey, we've had them now uh, since 1996 but they really became a, a significant problem in the beginning of the 2000s, 2001, 2002. And we had the big Asian tiger mosquito project in 2008, where we tried to develop strategies for area-wide control of these mosquitoes. Because it does take 
a village to control the mosquito. You cannot control uh, these mosquitoes in, in your backyard because you're gonna get mosquitoes from your neighbors. The fact is sort of a classical, what happens in Vegas does not stay in Vegas. Um, and it doesn't matter if you have a beautiful um, high-end high um, suburban environment or if you have a dilapidated um, sort of very low-income um, urban environment, these mosquitoes are gonna be present when there's people and there are containers. So the fact is that invasive aedes develop primarily and almost exclusively in private properties. Um, so um, they're, they're coming out of small containers and although we tend to think of them as associated with trash, they are not necessarily um, as part of the, um, sorry, I just need to remove, can't really see part of my screen, there we go. Um, they also actually associated with um, things like recycling containers. So when you're saying get rid of trash, um, it's great, get rid of trash. But most of us don't really have trash in our, in our backyards or front yards, where we actually have our just containers. You have that yogurt cup that just rolled under the bush and you don't really know that it's there. Uh, but those are the kinds of containers that are, when they fill up with water, are gonna be a source of this kind of mosquito. But actually even more um, sort of, we, we, we had an Asian tiger mosquito project for two years before we realized that these um, ways of removing the water from the, from the gutters were actually a tremendous source of this mosquito. Every single one of these little accordion little folders are actually ways in which um, are places where this mosquito and almost exclusively this mosquito species can develop. Uh, the paper we published is actually, the title is Crouching Tiger Hidden Trouble. Um, it took us, uh, uh, as I mentioned, uh, a while to figure out that this was actually one of the primary sources of, of the, this mosquito species in just beautifully uh, well landscaped and clean um, suburban environments where people were not able to go outside because they were getting bit relentlessly by the Asian tiger mosquito. We also is a fact that risk of insecticide resistance development increases when control is disorganized or inefficient and we know insecticide resistance is, is a genetic basis and it is heritable. At some point, you actually have fixation of the, of the genes that are sort of single point mutation that, the, that result in insecticide resistance, and you just cannot revert that. So it's really important to um, try and, and limit as much as possible the development of insecticide resistance, because we truly have very few, um, right now, only two modes of action. In some parts of Europe, a single mode of action uh, pyrethroids that are used for um, controlling um, public health pests like mosquitoes. Also, it is a fact that mosquitoes move across yards, across states, and across the world. Um, those little single eggs, in some cases, are, in, are um, desiccation resistant, or at least they can basically survive for a while without any water. So they can be transported across the world. Um, that's how they got here. Um, they, I should mention, the, the Asian tiger mosquito was first detected as an established population in 1985 in Texas, um, in Harris County, uh, where Houston is, and um, then just spread um, east, south, and then north, and as I've mentioned, it's been spreading north ever since, and, and as it spreads, it becomes, uh, once established, becomes more and more and more common. And also, it is a fact that organized mosquito control, even in places that have uh, very strong programs, cannot afford to enter every private yard to control mosquitoes. And, and in many cases, for these types of mosquitoes, it basically requires the classical uh, tip and toss. But in, in many of these cases, you really can't just tip and toss because the eggs are not on the water surface. They're actually on the surface of the container. So if you tip, um, and then if it fills up with water again, the eggs are gonna hatch. So you really need to remove uh, the, the containers, scrub the containers, or prevent the eggs from being laid to start with. So um, I was approached in 2016 by a community in suburban Maryland, uh, the town of University Park. So some of the um, community members approached me. They had heard that I'd been working on the Asian tiger mosquito and they were definitely having a problem with that, with that species. So they reached out and asked me if I could help them. Um, this is a community, pretty old community, lots of vegetation, just perfect habitat for the Asian tiger mosquito. Um, high end, uh, in terms of mid, mid, uh, mid, middle class um, environment, um, but clean yards. 
And actually they had had a very intensive program called Take Back Our Yards um, from since 2012, where they were doing just all the right things that we tell people to do to remove um, a habitat for the Asian tiger mosquito. They were going door to door. They had an intern paid by the University Park program um, to explain to people what containers are, what mosquitoes are, how to get rid of containers, tip and toss, you know, the full, the full program. And they still had a very significant mosquito uh, problem. As I said, primarily the Asian tiger mosquito. And I know that because I got bit a lot when I came to, to visit. So I, I went home after visiting and, and meeting with the community members at a local church um, and, and started reading about what could be done to control um, Asian tiger mosquitoes above and beyond what they were doing already. And at the time it had been shown that um, a paper uh, by Roberto Barrera in Puerto Rico, um, member of the CDC, a researcher at CDC, that approximately 80% reduction in Aedes aegypti, the yellow fever mosquito that transmits Zika and yellow fever and chikungunya. Um, in, at the time, uh, chikungunya was just about to start going through Puerto Rico. Uh, they had shown that they could use traps, so massive sort of a, a area-wide deployment of traps and they had successfully reduced 80s Egypti populations down by 80%, so extremely significantly. And actually later we're able to show very significant reduction in cases of uh, chikungunya in Puerto Rico. Um, and, and so that was actually the first time that mosquito control um, really had a, based on, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about sort of the biology, controlling the, the females that lay the eggs had been shown uh, to, to have an impact on disease transmission. And this is, I know, maybe surprising, but the fact is that um, sort of demonstration of epidemiological effects of mosquito control is actually a pretty rare um, success story. So the AGO, the uh, 80s, the 80s um, gravid ovitrap, um, is what the CDC used. It's basically a five gallon bucket with water and then this, this opening in here has sticky paper and mosquitoes land on sticky paper, get stuck and they die. Um, so these AGO traps were deployed and maintained by professionals and they did that in over 80% of the yards in each of these communities, several different communities in Puerto Rico. Um, there's multiple papers um, between 2014 and even 2020 on this approach, uh, very successful. And, and I thought, okay, well, um, I let's go talk to the neighbors. So I went back, gave them a presentation, explaining sort of all the details. In fact, at the time we actually wrote a review of the overall approaches for these sort of um, wide scale uh, trap based um, control for uh, uh, mosquitoes for arboviral control, which we published. And so I, I spoke to the neighbors, explained all the details and there was a lot of interest, a lot of questions, very interesting, um, sort of overview of what they thought, you know, it was, just, it was great. It was actually a great teaching experience for myself. And I hope, that, and I, I feel it did also for the residents. And I proposed to them at the time, the AGO was not for sale, but there was this GAT, the Gravid 80s trap that was available for sale. And the GATs are basically kind of a variation, slightly smaller if you notice, but it's kind of the same principle. You basically have a bucket that you, where you put water, and you can even put a, a little bit of fish food or, or a little bit of hay or something to create just an infusion. You do not want to create a stinky kind of environment. Um, and then on top of that, there's a, this um, dome that has a, a mosquito netting underneath the dome. Um, and then the opening is, is here on the top. So the mosquito female is looking for a place to lay eggs, um, senses, smells, the, the water in the bucket goes in through the only opening available cannot reach the water because there's a mosquito netting in between. Um, and then when it tries to exit, you notice this dome is transparent. And so these are day biting mosquitoes. They're very connected or sort of likely to go forward towards the light. And um, when they reach the, this transparent dome, um, either they are, um, the, the dome is sprayed with canola oil, which is what we used uh, initially. Um, but now this, these traps are sold with a, a sticky paper that basically hangs on, on this area here. And um, the mosquitoes either get covered in oil and, and die or they um, sort of attach to the sticky paper. 
um, the mosquito cannot escape and dies. So um, the traps are relatively cheap. They're about 15 to $18 each with uh, um, plus shipping and handling. They're easy to deploy, they're easy to maintain, and there are no dangerous insecticides. So um, to be fair, technically, originally, the, the, the traps were sold with the intention, but to professional mosquito control programs, to the intention to use insecticides on the dome. But we basically uh, proposed that they use canola oil. There was an unrelated paper showing that canola oil can work as a sort of a deterrent of mosquitoes. It's kind of a, um, a physical restraint. The, the, the mosquitoes basically can't fly. And again, now with the sticky paper, it's completely a, a, a physical restraint. I did a first analysis to check if these traps did attract and, and collect um, the mosquitoes I wanted to attack, which are Aedes albopictus, the Asian tiger mosquito, and I was very happy to be able to report to the neighbors that indeed the primary um, mosquitoes caught by the traps were the Asian tiger mosquito. There was a little bit of other local mosquitoes. This is the tree hole mosquito. As I mentioned, this is a very... Um, forested area. So the Aedes triceriatus is also present. And early in the season and late in the season, we also got another invasive, Aedes japonicus. Other, the other mosquitoes such as Culex, which um, are the ones that lay the egg rafts, are really not that much, not attracted to these traps because the amount of water is too small in these traps. So Culex are much, much more likely to go towards, you know, abandoned swimming pools and catch basins and bigger kinds of containers which are actually relatively efficiently controlled in general by mis professional mosquito controls because they have access to them. It's the small little containers that are much harder to, um, to address. So this was actually done in 2016. And then in 2017, the community, I started working with them in 16. In 17, they really decided they wanted to do this for real. But how do you engage a community, right? So this is a small group of citizens, about, about 10 or so that had contacted me um, we now needed to take an entire community, which is about a thousand homes, about 3,000 people that live in this community, and try to get about 80% of them to, um, to do the purchase and deployment of these traps so that we can actually do a mass trapping. So what we end up doing is we spoke to the manufacturer and we, I was able to purchase about a thousand GATs. They come in, in groups of 24. Um, we developed the website and then obtained address and contact information from the residents buying the trap. So the residents bought all the traps, um, and, um, but it, by buying the traps, they provided us with the information of who they were, where, where they lived. So we had an idea of who had the traps. Um, we also provided step-by-step -step brochures available on our website and also in printed versions. And then we did a lot of several um, gap distribution and demonstration um, events. Uh, to, the community came over to purchase the traps and see them here sort of holding the, the brand new trap with the instructions right there that explains what the mosquitoes are, what the entire thing is about, and then how to exactly how to deploy. Uh, we then had demonstration. This is actually at the time my 14 year old giving a demonstration. Both my sons were involved in this. This was really kind of a, um, no funds. All the funds for this were provided by the, the citizens. So they purchased the traps and we were able to do um, the, the, the demonstration. We also did a lot of town hall events, a sustainable Maryland webinar, a dog strut get demo, a 4th of July parade. Uh, all the residents did this. I was just basically there to provide scientific information. So they took the bottom of the traps and made them into these big bells with a little bell on the inside um, to let freedom ring and uh, a mosquito with a, with a dash. So it's just actually a lot of fun. Um, lots of ideas from the community on how to engage their, their neighbors. Um, then this is actually a picture of the university park. As I mentioned, there's about a thousand homes. The trap purchase started in early May. Uh, the traps arrived in early June. First distribution was in mid-June. We're just at the beginning of the mosquito season. We had three large distribution events, and then we had distribution through the street captains. What you'll see here is the entire community in, in each one of these little um, sort of rectangles is a, a lot with a home in them. The green um, locations are the, the homes that already had bought the traps from the previous year. And then um, there's a little video showing you as over time, um, the, the number of the communities that 
that bought traps. The community, actually the neighbors bought traps for the school. So the school, which is this big rectangle here in the, in the middle, also had um, traps. The idea is for each, each home to have two GAT traps so that we had um, a good coverage. Now, this is what we got by the end of it. So not really 80%. So what we actually got was out of the original um, the, the 1,156 potential household, about 45% of them purchased and deployed these two GATs. So we had about 1,000 GATs deployed in the uh, University Park in 2017. So we didn't get 80% across the entire community, but what we realized, and also if you study the biology of these mosquitoes, these are not strong flying mosquitoes. What we actually realized is that we had high blocks and low blocks. We had blocks where a lot of the residents had bought traps, and then we had blocks where very few residents had bought traps. So I decided to take the, you know, the eggs and, um, what is it? No, I got lemons and I made lemonade. So what we realized is that we can actually make this um, into a, a plus. So now how do you check if this worked or not? Well, to check if the deployment of, of traps that really are just killing uh, females that are trying to lay eggs. So technically those females already bit somebody or something. These will also bite, bird, uh, will also bite dogs and, and cats and, and other mammals. They're mammalian biters. Um, well, then you have to use a different kind of trap to know if it worked or not. To do that, we use BG Sentinel traps. This is sort of the standard for um, collecting host seeking, so blood seeking females. So these traps are actually, um, they, they, they function with a lure. Um, the lure is this thing right, right here. So this is actually a stinky feet. And trust me, it smells like stinky feet. I had this thing in my car a lot. Um, the, the lures are put here on the side. It's actually, they, there's a little slot now that you just insert the lure. Uh, and then there's air circulation, which is driven by a 12 volt battery. Um, that creates circulation so that air goes out and attracts mosquitoes. The mosquitoes go in, the only way in is through this, this hole up here on, on the top. Um, there's a fan uh, underneath and then there's a, a net that captures the mosquitoes. So if you deploy this um, and you can basically we deployed it all over um, the, the university park and I'll show you that in a minute, you can get an idea of, of the sort of biting um, pressure in particular locations. So what we did was we created a, um, a system where we put these traps in high areas and low areas of views of the GATs um, and were able to um, then uh, survey so eight weeks uh, from the beginning of August, like around now, until the end of September. This is peak season. Right now, we're, <laughs> this time is, is, the is actually the peak uh, numbers of Asian tiger mosquitoes. Um, the population has just increased over, over the season um, and a little bit later in the, in the year is actually starting to disappear as the females lay eggs that don't hatch anymore. So if you look at this, we had um, about 19 different locations across the town. Uh, we had locations uh, that had high coverage and low coverage. But what we really realized, so this is the mean number of, of the Asian tiger mosquito caught on the BGS traps based on trap coverage of the GAT crab traps, the little um, traps that are just uh, collecting uh, host, uh, sorry, mosquitoes that are looking for a place to lay eggs. So there's a significant um, decrease in the, in the numbers of uh, mosquitoes found in high blocks versus low blocks. But what we realized that the big difference was really not about high and low, it was above 80%, that magical number. You have more than 80% trap coverage in a block um, you have a significant lower number of um, mosquitoes, um, the females looking for a blood meal. So that's what is about a 76% reduction. So in the ballpark of that 80% reduction that Roberta Barrera had found for the yellow fever mosquito. But you notice this was done by homeowners, not by a professional group of uh, CDC um, um, researchers. Um, and also, not only did we find a significant reduction in, the, in, in, in areas that had more than 80% coverage, we saw that that was true across the entire season. So from the beginning, in 11th of August until uh, so at the end of September, we really had much less um, 
pressure, for a biting pressure in the areas that had high coverage of GATS. All right, so what also like in terms of uh, this, this coverage was, was really random. So that these very high um, areas, which are about, there were about uh, six, are really all over the, the town. So it's not that there was a particular corner of the town that just had less uh, Asian tiger mosquitoes biting. So in the end, by, by doing this analysis within the town, we're able to control for past source reduction, education experience, which would have been impossible to replicate elsewhere. I had thought originally that I would compare this with local sort of surrounding communities, but surrounding communities really had very different experiences in terms of, of this very intensive cleanup that the, the town of University Park had. So if you looked around the community, you don't see a lot of uh, habitat for mosquitoes. Um, so this is really addressing these cryptic habitats that Asian tiger mosquito can find and we're really bad at being able to, to reduce. So really what, what I found with, in this experience is that if you deploy these GAT traps, you do see a lot of dead mosquitoes. These are about 150 or so um, uh, mosquitoes is over a week um, that are dead mosquitoes, um, which are pregnant females. So the eggs and the mosquitoes are, are killed and each female lays between something like 50 and, and 100 eggs. So you're really reducing the population quite a bit. But, um, and which, you know, get mosquito control. But there was another part to it. We also found that there was a lot of hands-on mosquito biology that got passed on by this experience. Uh, this is a local resident talking to his sons and some of the residents, uh, some of the neighbors' uh, kids in the area that really helped out in terms of setting up the traps, maintaining the traps throughout the season. So there was a lot of hands-on mosquito biology, which meant that uh, kids and and, and adults understood better what a mosquito was, what kind of, what is a container. So more containers were removed and that leads to additional mosquito control. So you have this sort of spiral of knowledge, which the terminology actually came up with by one of the neighbors, um, that ends up having control through the traps and control by education that um, I'm hoping can be part, of, that's why I'm talking to you now from the school IPM. IPM. Can this approach be school IPM? So in, in the end, the, the, in the Northeast schools kind of end before mosquito season, but they restart at or near its peak. Um, the, the eggs of 80s mosquitoes survive the winter as, as, as eggs. And then you have throughout the season, so early in, in the late April or so, again, depending on latitude, you start getting hatching, you start development, and you often have two to three cohorts so you have the adults coming out laying eggs, that's what this female is doing. And then you have another cohort and another cohort and the average catch on a BGS trap ends up going up and up and up. And this is where um, school usually starts, somewhere around, around here. So you have compound growth over the summer. So what can be done at school? And really, you tell me, um, but some of the ideas I've thought about, um, community control can be integrated in theoretical or hands-on civic responsibility classes. We're all in this together. You have biology with habitat removal, uh, examples of mosquito development. We often do very easy, you know, mosquito, we give eggs and, and you go all the way to seeing the adult emerging. Um, you have, you can look at economics, the give and take of uh, our early um, control and also that compound growth. And also the school can be community catalyst and source of information. Other ways, please, I would love to have feedback on how this could be done. Lessons learned in general was that mosquitoes are a great gateway topic. Everybody agrees that you don't wanna be bit by a mosquito. Community organization for mosquito control can actually create connections that can be long lasting. For example, University Park, they used some of the connections that were done through the mosquito control program to develop aging in place programs. Completely unrelated, but now people know each other. Also found that dead mosquitoes on a trap are a very positive reinforcement for continued engagement. So that transparent dome or even the sticky paper are great ways to have the community remain in, engaged. So he's paying for the trap, even though the trap is like 15 bucks, which may be too much in some communities, but maybe uh, something that is that a lot of communities can do easily. And that investment makes people much more likely to actually continue engaged. 
And also, it was clear that residents as students like to be heard and see their contributions used. Finally, everyone needs science. Science needs everyone. Um, this is a picture of a mosquito. If you don't believe me, this is actually a mosquito, a Malaya species that um, tickles ants, chromatogaster ants, to steal the nectar from them. So not all mosquitoes are in there to get blood. Here's a mosquito that is the cutest and cuddliest of things, although it is a thief. I was an ant, I wouldn't like this, this mosquito very much, but mosquitoes are fascinating creatures, great biology, great teaching moments, and I hope we can integrate um, the concept of controlling mosquitoes into um, school IPM. Thank you. Thank you, Dina. Uh, we have one quick question from Jody Gangoff Kaufman. There's an 880s gravid trap called Into Care, which uses a, a Bavaria treated screen and an IGR pyroproxifen treated water. What do you think of these traps? Um, actually, I'm not really familiar with these traps. The, the, my understanding um, is that I haven't seen sort of a demonstration of them working in a, in a, in a setting. I know they were being used in Florida. Um, so, I mean, the concept is perfectly reasonable. Um, the idea is to, and, and again, there, I've seen a lot of variations on those kinds of traps. Uh, my understanding with, the, with that one is that that's actually one of those traps where the mosquito picks up the growth regulator when it goes in to try to get to the water. And then the female, as it goes into other containers to actually lay eggs, is depositing this growth regulator in the water as it's laying the eggs. And so the idea is that when the eggs hatch, um, the insecticide uh, pyroproxifen, which is, works in very low concentration, would then be um, doing the, the control. And the idea is that, uh, as we described, that since females cannot, since we, females are much better at finding the containers than we are, um, that um, that's a way of being able to address uh, the, these cryptic containers. Uh, I think th the concept is a, is a really interesting concept. I've seen a lot of variation on that. I have not yet seen a clear demonstration of, of control. Okay, thank you. 